Customer service done right can be your company's single biggest competitive advantage. Welcome to the customer service revolution. Join customer service authority and best-selling author John DeJulius as he interviews leaders who are revolutionizing their industries. This is more than a podcast, though. It's a movement. The customer service revolution is a radical overthrow of conventional business mentality designed to transform what customers and employees experience. If you are a revolutionary customer service leader who's ready to stop competing on price and obsessed with building a brand that people cannot live without, this podcast is for you. Welcome to the Customer Service Revolution podcast with John DeJulius. This week, we welcome guest host Dave Murray. Dave is the DeJulius Group Senior Customer Experience Consultant, and he's going to share how companies can deliver a consistently great customer experience. In this episode, you'll learn how to stand out in a crowded marketplace, how to ensure that you're able to maintain great service levels even during rapid growth, how to deliver a consistent experience between departments, locations, and shifts, and how to create your own customer experience cycle. The creation of a customer experience cycle does four very important things for your business. Stick around and find out what those are. Now here's your host, Dave Murray. I am going to share a tool that hopefully takes some of the things that you've learned yesterday and today and gives you something you can go back and put into practice almost immediately. It's going to look at some of the things that Scott McCain talked about this morning when he talked about those those three keys that we have to focus on when we're having those experiences. And of course, John spoke this morning about creating your signature experience. And right now I wanna help you do just that. But first I wanna start with this. Think for a moment. You're not feeling well. A Couple days go by, maybe it starts to get a little worse. So you decide to take yourself to the emergency room, you better get checked out. You go to the emergency room, you wait a few hours, they take you in, they check you out. They say, well, we have good news. It's nothing life-threatening, but we do want to admit you. We do want to check a few things out. So we're going to have you stay here for a couple of days. So they admit you. You go up to your room. And over the next couple of days, you start to feel fear about your future and what's happening. You start to feel a little, a little anger, right, that you're missing out. This was unexpected. Now all of a sudden you're missing out on your weekend or whatever it was you had going on. But mostly you feel appreciation for the people that are taking care of you, the doctors, the nursing staff that's there 24-7 making sure that you're feeling okay. So about three days go by, and on day number three, seven in the morning, the overnight nurse pops in and says, good news, you get to go home today. You're thrilled. She doesn't really elaborate, just says you're going to get to go home. So you start to make some assumptions in your mind, okay, 7 a.m., I'll be out of here by 9, 10. I'll be home for lunch. That's great. You call your spouse, right? She says, you know what? I'll take the morning off. I have, to, I have a big meeting in the afternoon, but I'll take the morning off. I'll come down, pick you up, get you all packed up. Can't wait to get you home, honey. All right, so by 8.30 a.m., you're packed up. You're sitting there. You're ready to go. 10 o'clock comes. 11 o'clock comes. Noon, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock comes. Nothing. All of a sudden at 2.30, a nurse comes in and says, you know what? Sorry about the delay. We just have a couple more things to do on your paperwork, and then we'll get you out of here by four. Four. In the morning, you thought you were going to be home for lunch. Now you're going to barely make it home for dinner. That scenario that I just took you through happens at Flagler Hospital in St. Augustine, Florida, multiple times per day when they're discharging patients. Multiple times per day, patients are making assumptions not having expectations set, and then they're disappointed after what was otherwise a really good experience for them. They were treated well, and now all of a sudden, they have a really bad taste in their mouth. It obviously was leading to a bad last impression, but also lowering their scores. They're all inpatient satisfaction scores, all because they weren't properly setting expectations. So what I can share with you in the work that we've done with them and what other great companies do is they make sure that they are being proactive. 
They now look, where can they be proactive on setting those expectations? What are their opportunities to set those expectations? Because again, we talked about it a lot today. If we don't give our team members the roadmap, they're gonna, they're gonna interpret that differently. They're gonna make assumptions that that patient, that customer, whoever they are, they know what we're talking about. So I wanna ask you, where can you be more proactive in your organization when it comes to setting expectations. If you just give it a, a, a thought for a minute or two, you can probably come up with three or four right off the bat. So Jess talked about this yesterday, the importance of setting expectations internally from your, your teams to your teams, right? And making sure that they're communicating properly, that everyone who needs to know the information knows the information. John talked about it earlier today about setting expectations and those non-negotiable standards. And I'm gonna talk about that a little more today. Where do you have an opportunity to be better? Here's an example that I love. So this is when John wrote his fifth book, The Relationship Economy. The publisher was the business and John was the customer. What you see in, in green were the things that were John's responsibility to get done in order to get this project done on time. What you see in white was what the company had to do to get things done on time. They were very clear and very upfront. If these things all happen, if you do what you have to do, if we do what we have to do and we hit these deadlines, this book will be published and in stores on the select date. Do you have areas where your customers have some responsibility? where they have some things that they have to bring to the table. Are you setting those expectations clearly enough? Do they know that if they miss a deadline, if they don't do what they need to do, that it may push back the overall date, that they may not meet the dates that they were hoping to meet of delivery, whatever that product may be. If you're not setting those expectations, the answer is probably no. I've talked a lot about Colton RV the last two days and we started working with them in 2019, and it's been a great experience. And we went through the customer experience cycle, and I'm gonna talk briefly today about what a customer experience cycle looks like and, and how you can use it. But first, I wanna show you their example. We went through that workshop, and the, and the deliverable was their customer service playbook, where we identified the important stages that they have with their customers, and we created the standards that their team members have to follow every single time they have that experience. Again, that's the consistency, every single time. So I wanna show you a quick example. The one circled in red, so that's the delivery, right? So you buy your new vehicle, you buy your new RV, you're so excited. You can't wait to go pick it up the day of delivery. You probably have a little buyer's remorse. You're wondering, can I really afford this thing? I gotta go sign a bunch of paperwork. It's practically like closing on a house. I gotta do all this paperwork, but I'm really excited, I can't wait. They needed to make sure that they were setting proper expectations. The reality is when you pick up your new RV, that's a three to four hour process. Sometimes they were not great in letting their customers know that. Sometimes customers would show up thinking they'd be out of there in an hour, not after lunch. Right? They didn't realize they had to take off a half day of work because they weren't setting the proper expectations. What was happening is they were taking a day that was supposed to be so exciting. After all, an RV is probably the second or maybe the largest purchase you've ever made in your life for some people. And they were delivering a poor last experience because the expectations were lacking. I also had a chance this summer to work with Lippert Components. Anyone ever hear of Lipper Components? I didn't think so. So Lipper Components, if you own an RV, if you own a boat, if you own a trailer, if you own a, a truck that has a lift gate, you are most likely a customer of Lippert even though you don't know it. Right? They manufacture all the components that make those things work. Right? They're behind the scenes manufacturing. We worked on their customer experience cycle and we created an entire stage on setting expectations. A tool that their team members are following every single time they are dealing with any customer, primarily in their call center. The first one on the standards list is templates, making sure that our teams are delivering a consistent message 
to whomever our customers are. It makes me think of Dan Gingas' great story yesterday about Chewy.com. Right? What templates can you put in place so you're sure that you are delivering a consistent message to your team? So I'm going to show you real quickly how we create this. This is, this is the finished product. This is the deliverable. This is the training tool. This is the playbook. I'm going to share with you how we actually create that. But before I do, who wants to play a game? Anybody? No? Okay, we'll play it. I love the song. Love it. All right. It's time to play Customer Service Revolution Family Feud. Who's in? All right. Top four answers on the board. Why do customers leave our organizations? Why do customers leave our companies to go somewhere else? Here are the top four answers. Number four unknowledgeable employees. They just don't know their stuff. Huh, interesting one. Number three, untrusted companies. They don't believe us, or maybe we've let them down in the past, so they don't have a reason to believe us. Number two, unfriendly service. We're just being transactional. We're going through the motions. Maybe we have some empathy fatigue like John talked about this morning. And the number one answer as to why customers leave us, survey says, bad employee attitudes. But wait a minute, where's price? I thought for sure price would be in the top four, or maybe a product issue. If you look at this list, these are all things that we as an organization can control if we focus on it. But again, most organizations don't. They don't take the time, they make assumptions, we hire good people, they seem like nice people, they seem to understand us as an organization. They'll provide great service, but they never create that roadmap of what it looks like. So the good news that I have for you is, we have a tool that does just that. We call it the customer experience cycle. And what we do is we identify what are your most critical touch points that you have with your customers. Sometimes they're in a cycle, like a, a simple one like Chick-fil-A, you go in, you place your order, you pay, they present your order, and you leave, right? Sometimes they're really simple. Sometimes they're really complex. Sometimes organizations have multiple CECs, multiple experiences that they need to really map out so their team members know what they look like. You're listening to the Customer Service Revolution podcast. You've probably read all of John's books, so you're obviously passionate about the customer experience. Have you ever considered a career as a customer experience coach? The DeJulius Group can train and license you in the same methodology that our consultants use. It's the same framework that's being used in companies like Starbucks, Chick-fil-A, Nestle, and the Ritz-Carlton's. Our Coach Camp gives you the tools to start your own business as a CX coach. If you're ready to invest in your future and build a business around your passion for the customer experience, contact Claudia at thedejuliusgroup.com or visit cxcoaching.com. But here's the thing we do. We identify your most critical touch points, and then we do this. We break those down into four buckets, four very important buckets. The first one is service defects. What are the things that can and do go wrong when we are having this interaction with one of our customers? What can go wrong? We're out of stock, phone system is slow, whatever that is. We look at these for two reasons. One is hopefully we can maybe solve some of those problems, have them occur less often. But at the very least, let's make sure our team members are aware of it, that they know this is gonna happen so they're prepared to deal with it. The second thing we look at, what are our operational standards? Now, a lot of times these things already exist in the standard operating procedures manual somewhere that probably needs to be dusted off, just like the training that the chief was talking about earlier. Right? They didn't wanna dust something off. But a lot of times those SOPs already exist, 
but we want to have them in an easy place to follow. And you may want to find out how often are our teams following them. You might have some inconsistencies in your SOPs. Now here's the thing. This, these first two, this is where most companies stop. This is what most companies have, right? Their SOPs, the, the hard skill training, if you will. Most companies don't do what comes next. And that's when we look at experiential. What soft skills can we add? If during the interaction we have to get the customer's name, use the customer's name. It's such a great way to build rapport. Make sure that it's on our list of standards so that we're doing it. So what are your soft skills that you can add to your standards? The last column, above and beyond opportunities. They don't have to be huge, like Dan Gingas mentioned yesterday. It's just a little extra, right? It doesn't have to be giving stuff away for free. But when the opportunity allows itself, meaning when we have the time, when we, we're available, the customer's here, whether it's on the phone or in person, whatever that looks like, and we have the time, there's not a line, there's not a queue, what can we go ahead and do to make this experience even a little better? Just a little better. So those are the four buckets that we break your critical interactions into. One of the great things about this exercise is we do this with your team, right? Your teams get together and they walk around in small groups and they create this, right? They create your solutions. It's not leadership. It's not someone from the DeJulius group saying, do this, do that. It's your actual teams in a room together, team building exercise, creating your experience. So that's how we create it. And then we create the deliverable. And here's what it looks like. This is an advanced financial example. What changed? The standards are combined. Was that Barbara? Thank you, Barbara. The standards are combined. Because here's the reason. While we started with our four buckets, and we have to start with four buckets, you know why? Organizations have plenty of operational. Most have zero to very, very few experiential. We have to make sure we have enough. So we have to have them as two separate buckets as we're creating this tool. But when we roll it out to our teams, Quite frankly, it doesn't matter if it's operational or experiential, it's just a standard. And if it's on our standards list, we execute it every single time we have that interaction with the customer. And that's where we get our consistency. We're not playing rep roulette like John and Jess talked about earlier today. It's not based on what rep you get is how good your experience is going to be. Everyone has a consistent guide to follow to deliver the experience that you as the organization want to deliver. I have a couple more examples I want to share with you. Going back to Lippert. So Lippert is a call center environment. They're having some issues right now, right? Parts availability, manufacturing availability. There's some issues in the marketplace right now. They're getting some upset customers. John talked a little bit about customer rage this morning. They're dealing with it, right? They have a lot of heated customers that are calling back, checking in, not getting the answers they want. So we really focused on how can we de-escalate these calls, right? So some of the standards, making sure that your team members are focused on that customer, not multitasking, not trying to get something done for that last customer while this customer is coming into my headset and upset, right? Focus on that customer. Listen to them, let them vent. Be confident. Maybe using the mirroring technique, if anyone knows the mirroring technique, right? Customer comes in, they're upset, they're mad. What's our natural inclination as a human, right? We go right up there with them. He's, oh yeah, well, you're mad, well okay. Right? We, we get up, we get a high pitch, we yell right back. Do the opposite, right? Oh, I understand, I understand you're upset, sir. Yeah, I, I, I would be upset too, I totally get it. Let me, let me tell you what we can do. Right, because then they start to mirror you. But we need to make sure our team members are trained to do that. They know what that looks like. They've, they've role played it. Because again, the natural instinct will take over in those heated situations if we're not prepared. And we created a stage on parts not available. I don't know if you saw this on the news this morning. There are currently 76 cargo ships 
in a bottleneck at the port of Los Angeles, right? 76 ships full of cargo that can't get to where it needs to go, right? Some of those containers may hold things that Lippert is waiting for, right? So what happens when your team members don't have the parts? What are their options? Is it just a simple, sorry, I don't have it. You can call us back next week. Or do you have some standards in place for them to follow? Do they have some opportunities to do something for that customer as opposed to nothing? So the CEC, the customer experience cycle, is such a powerful tool. I want to share this quick anecdote. I, I mentioned yesterday how I ran into Jay Jeffrey in the, in the lobby before the conference started and we had a great conversation. He gave me two great nuggets of information. First, how their internal culture is fueling their growth. That's what I shared with you yesterday, right? The fact that their inter inter internal culture is in a great place and they are ready to grow when their competitors are not. But here's what else he shared with me that I thought was really, really interesting. He said, we can tell how our customer experience cycle is working by looking at a map and comparing it to COVID. And here's what he meant. When COVID was spiking in areas, and more restrictions were put into place, their MPS scores actually dipped a little bit. While in other parts of the country that there weren't as many restrictions, things were kind of maybe a little more business as usual, their scores either stayed the same or went up. And what they realized was that some of those restrictions out there, and obviously the restrictions are important, they're in there for safety, but what some of those restrictions were doing, they were limiting their team members from the ability to execute what's on their CEC. So it was living proof that the CEC is working for them and that when they can execute it, scores go up. When they don't have the opportunity to execute it, scores go down. Speaking of standards, think about this. When COVID hit, a lot of organizations had to remove some of the standards they've had, they had in place, right? If, if any of you flew during COVID, if you had to go somewhere, if you fly and you have any status, that, that didn't matter, right? It was just, it was every person for themselves. We were all just equal level playing field as customers. So I, I'd ask you this, as we begin to emerge from this pandemic and in some parts of the country, we're starting to get back to normal and do things that we used to do with a little more regularity. Maybe it's time to do an experience audit. Maybe it's time to look and see if some of those things that you used to do before COVID but had to drop off didn't come back. Because if you're not careful, maybe they didn't come back. Maybe some people created some bad habits. Oh, this is easier just not to do that for the customer. Let's just let this slide. Let's just keep doing it this way. So now may be the time to do an audit on your experience not only to make sure what you think should be happening and is happening, but also to look where can we add more experiential? How can we make this experience even better? So if you don't want Simon Holland to send a tweet out like this about your organization, I love Simon Holland, He's, I follow him on Twitter. If you want to avoid a tweet like this, creating your customer experience standards Creating your CEC is a great place to start. And so my challenge to you all is this, and I leave you with this. Go back to your office, go back to your plant, go back to wherever it is that you work, and identify what are those critical customer touch points that you have, the critical ones. Start there, start with the most important, then you can work your way down. Focus on the most important and then decide what standards can we create to drive consistency and build the experience that we want to build? Thank you very much. Thanks for listening to the Customer Service Revolution podcast with John DeJulius. Did you enjoy this episode? Consider leaving us a review. We value your feedback and love to hear how you're using the podcast in your organization. To hear more, be sure to subscribe now on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Thanks for being part of the Customer Service Revolution. 